So far we've talked about acids and bases in terms of the Arrhenius definition. And recall that the Arrhenius definition said that an acid is a substance that produces hydronium ion in water and a base is a substance that produces hydroxide ions in water. So by the Arrhenius definition, we have in this circle all of the acids and bases that are defined by the Arrhenius definition. Then we broaden our definition to the Bronsted-Lowry definition. And recall that the Bronsted-Lowry definition is that an acid is a substance that donates a proton and a base is a substance that accepts a proton. The thing about the Bronsted-Lowry definition is it includes all of the acids and bases in this circle, which means that if we can define it as an Arrhenius acid or base, it is by default also, it can be defined as a Bronsted-Lowry definition. But what we have as we take our studies further, especially as you go on to organic chemistry next semester, is we want to be able to define acids and bases more broadly. And so along comes Lewis. Um, this is the same guy who gave us our Lewis structures and he came up with another definition of acids and bases which broadens it. Now, again, like the Bronsted-Lowry, it includes all of the acids and bases which have previously been defined, but now it includes some other reactions that wouldn't necessarily be defined as Bronsted-Lowry, but now we can call them acids and bases by the Lewis definition. And in the Lewis definition of an acid and a base, an acid is a substance that accepts a pair of electrons. Notice that we are accepting for the acid and of course this is exactly opposite of our of who is accepting in the Bronsted-Lowry definition which is why you have to kind of think about it. Acids accept a pair of electrons and a base donates a pair of electrons. Remember that the Bronsted-Lowry was that the acid donated the proton and a base accepted the proton. Now we have our accept and donate exactly opposite but we're not talking about a proton, we're talking about a pair of electrons. Now again, if I draw a reaction that includes um, an acid and a base by the Arrhenius definition, I can show you how it also fits the Lewis definition. But in my mind, why bother? If it already fits the Arrhenius definition and I see that clearly, I don't have to go any further. If I draw a reaction and you can define the acid and the base by the Bronsted-Lowry definition, that means they also can be defined by the Lewis definition, but why bother? You, you've already proven that they are acids and bases. You don't need to think any further. But your book does have some examples of these. What we generally use the Lewis definition for is for acids and bases that cannot necessarily be defined by the Arrhenius definition or the Bronsted-Lowry definition. And the famous example that all textbook, textbooks have is the reaction between ammonia and BF3. What ammonia and BF3 form is a, a, a coordinate covalent compound. What happens is that the nitrogen ends up bonded to the boron. If we look, ammonia has this Lewis structure. Uh, it is a pyramidal, a trigonal pyramidal uh, or pyramidal structure. It has a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen and the BF3 looks like this. Boron is an exception to the octet rule. He does not have eight. He only has six and he is trigonal planar. What happens in the formation of this compound is that the lone pair on the nitrogen get donated to the boron. They are donated to form a bond with the boron. So ammonia donates a pair of electrons. Ammonia is the Lewis base in this particular example. Um, we knew ammonia was a base. We've seen plenty of times when it can fit the Bronsted-Lowry definition, and we've also seen times when it can fit the Arrhenius definition if you put it in water. But in this case, it is not accepting a proton. It is not uh, producing the hydroxide ion. It is simply donating a pair of electrons to BF3. So in this case, BF3 is our Lewis acid.